part of our PET 1384 principles class. So talking basically this week about cardio and about flexibility. So let's dive right into the cardio part of everything. Although before we do start, I just want to mention a couple of things here. You're going to get some physiology stuff here. This is going to be obviously where we dive deeper into this, into our exercise physiology class, but just to kind of keep us you know, ahead of the curve and to kind of get some background information, we're going to do um, some of that physiology stuff just so that we can kind of, again, grow that vocabulary, grow the understanding so that when we do get to physiology or coming up in um, you know, nutrition class and everything like that, we'll be able to be you know, more accustomed to the terminology. So let's get down to it. All right, so cardiorespiratory endurance. Basically, what we're talking about here is how the lungs, the heart, and the blood vessels, so um, arteries, wow, arteries, capillaries, and veins all work together so that you can get to the point where the lungs will oxygenate blood, the heart will pump the blood to the whole body, and then the blood vessels will deliver it to those muscles that we're talking about, especially for exercise, so that we can then move efficiently and effectively to be able to make some change and to be able to, you know, eventually hit our goals that we're looking for in life. All right, depending upon what they are. So that's what we're more that's what we're really trying to do is get the out the outside oxygen to get delivered to the muscles so that they can perform some sort of activity that we're trying to do. Okay. So what are the benefits? You know, pretty simply put, we're trying to prevent cardiovascular disease, which we talked about last week. And then obviously, um, you know, cellular functioning is one of them, uh, muscular functioning. But again, you know, those are smaller compared to the, you know, body, body or weight maintenance, body fat, you know, percentage, you know, body composition. So um, just kind of a couple of things there. And then what this also does too is it helps us to fight off that ability to get into that those hypokinetic diseases where we're because we're not moving we are actually you know getting sick because of that okay so again trying to break down a little bit more we know we said everything about the lungs but it's how the pulmonary cardiovascular and muscular systems all work together in what we would call aerobic activity so those exercises or those physical activities that require oxygen so for our sake, if we're looking at it, we're looking at things that are like more prolonged, like running and biking and skiing, um, like, uh, like ski ergs and rowers that we're looking at like we have in the classroom. All right. So again, really quickly, let's, let's get, like I said, into that physiology component. The first thing we want to, you know, we're going to have happen is by breathing, we're getting, you know, oxygen in and getting CO2 out because the higher levels of CO2 can cause more complications and it requires changes in our body when we have too many high levels of CO2, all right? So again, oxygen gets brought in via the, you know, the, the nose or the mouth and then goes, travels down through the, the airway and ends up in these tiny um, air-filled sacs at the end of our bronchioles, at the ends of those tree branches. And those alveoli, like I said, are filled with CO2 and oxygen because it depends on if it's going in or out, okay? Oxygen obviously is coming in. So as soon as we get to that point, what's going to happen is oxygen is going to get transferred to the bloodstream. So in those alveoli, you'll have interaction between veins and capillaries. Well, the capillaries are going to pull the... Um, Capillaries are going to pull the oxygen out and start delivering the oxygen either through hemoglobin, like it says right here, or directly in the bloodstream, and it's going to send that to the heart where the blood will then get pumped to the rest of the body. Okay, Hemoglobin is almost like a magnet. It's almost like a magnetic form, um, a magnetic red blood cell, and it attracts many things, carbohydrates and oxygen being two really important things. But when oxygen is magnetized or adhered to the hemoglobin, it can transport it to where it's got to go. So then the heart pumps the blood out of the left ventricle to the arteries where it's going to again get transported to organs, to um, tissues, particularly muscle tissue, so that we can then work and work internally like we need to, which can then obviously produce external work like movement. All right. So also with 
cardiorespiratory, you know, fitness levels or endurance, cardiorespiratory endurance. We're talking here about how we need oxygen to then use ATP or as it says here, adenosine triphosphate so that we can then, like I said, do things like running and biking and rowing and, and those longer duration types of activities. All right. And then obviously we need oxygen present for cellular activities as well. Things like weight training, uh, sprint based types of activities, power, powerful, quick movements. Those don't necessarily need oxygen to support the muscles to, you know, use it for energy. What we're saying there is that that's truly ATP or ATP with the presence of carbohydrates. But again, that's going to be something we're going to talk about later on in X Fizz. Okay. Um, so the next part of this here is um, the higher the level of cardiorespiratory endurance, the ability that you have to deliver oxygen quicker, more efficiently, easier, and then therefore you can move better. Okay, those with lower, it's all opposite ends of the spectrum at that point there too. So um, also what we're looking for here with physiology with ATP in you know correspondence with each other is something called max oxygen uptake. And what that really means is that how much oxygen can your body consume, meaning take in, in that one minute time frame, obviously over the course of periods of time, but it's the maximum amount of oxygen your body can take in or consume um, at one time under high, the highest level of stress your body can take, meaning the maximal levels that you have. Now we can test for that um, and then we can obviously estimate that as well through other styles of testing, but maximum oxygen uptake, what we're saying is the max amount of oxygen you can take in and it can be dependent upon your body. So a bigger person, you know, whether that means bigger as in weight wise or height wise or both um, compared to a smaller person is going to need more oxygen because they have more surface area meaning they're, they're a bigger person, so therefore they need more oxygen because they have more fat cells, they have more muscle, they have more um, organ size, etc. So we look at all of those things in particular. All right. So when we talk about you know aerobic or anaerobic, meaning without oxygen, I kind of hit on this a little bit before, but aerobic meaning all these things right here. So on a test, you want to make sure you're paying attention to those types of activities, walking, jogging, swimming, cycling, Cross-country skiing, um, aerobics, as in like aerobic classes, and then rope skipping also, you know, I don't, I hate that term, but it is what it is, but jumping rope, okay? And then anaerobic are those more higher intensity things that you cannot do for, you know, really long periods of time. Like if you were to lift heavy weights, you can't lift heavy weights for, you know, two hours like a marathon runner can. You have to take breaks to be able to get through that where a marathon runner can continuously keep going. All right, so again, look at your time frames. Carried out for short periods, no more than two to three minutes at a time, okay? And then your examples for that, if we looked at that, would be, you know, one, two, and 400 meter, you know, track and field events, and then 100 meters in swimming, gymnastics routines, weight training, so strength training, all of those types of things, okay? So there's your benefits. Um, we talked about max oxygen uptake. Um, the ability to increase your oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, meaning that you're going to have um, a higher amount of blood volume and because your heart's working more effectively, but also you're having more red blood cells. So the more aerobically fit you get, the more red blood cells your body actually produces. Therefore, you can carry more oxygen. All right, you have a decreasing, decreased resting heart rate. All right, and that's really great that you can you know do that because that just means your heart at rest doesn't need to work as hard as it needs to while you're just sitting around the more work that you put on it the more stress it is the you know the, un the more unhealthy your heart becomes and then also you can have a and this one here is very important a lowered heart rate at a given workload if you're working at a maximal workload well then you're going to work at maximal so what we're saying here is that at sub maximal workloads we have a lowered heart rate, meaning that if you're working at 80% of your maximum heart rate, you actually, the more fit you get, the lower your heart rate would need to be to work out at the same 80% as somebody who is of less shape than you are. Okay. You also have increased number, size, and capacity of mitochondria. So you actually build up the mitochondria in your system. And if we remember correctly, mitochondria is where um, it's basically what we call the powerhouse or the furnace of the cell where all the, you know, all the, all the work is done where we can break ATP down there. 
and ATP, again, our energy currency, our energy source. So with mitochondria, the more of them we have, the bigger they are, the more capacity they are, the, be the easier it is for your system to work, okay? Now, in the mitochondria, we said that's, that, that, like I just told you, was that's where the aerobic part of everything um, actually takes place. So when you're breaking down ATP, it only happen aerobically, it only happens in the mitochondria. If it happens in what we call the cytosol or the inner portions of the uh, cell itself, then that's more anaerobic work where we don't require oxygen to break down ATP for energy, okay? We have better functioning capillaries, meaning they'll be able to push, you know, single cells of oxygen, single cells of red blood cells, nutrients, whatever it might be, they'll just work better. Your recovery time is improved, uh, meaning you'll reduce the time it takes after each exercise to be able to either go back again or to go to the next training day. Um, blood pressure comes down, your blood lipid levels, like your cholesterols, your triglycerides, um, they'll come down. You'll actually increase what we call fat burning enzymes or those enzymes that would be used for, you know, obviously maintaining body weight uh, and having your metabolism stay elevated, even though it's not putting more stress on your body. Uh, there's your faster recovery time between bouts again. Um, and then how much time your body takes to return to resting levels after exercise. So just say that you're a person who still feels winded five hours after, you know, as you become more fit and more aerobically fit, then, you know, that may only be an hour afterwards where you feel back to normal, all right? And then obviously better health and wellness overall. Those are really important for that. That This is just basically an image that shows everything we just talked about. But one cool thing is higher academic performance, meaning that you have better mind capacity and uh, your, you know, memory is improved, things like that, which was what we talked about last week. All right, here are different levels. So again, if you're a sedentary person, someone who does not train at all, someone who is trained and then someone who's highly trained, you can see how levels change here. Now I'll talk about these levels really quickly. Again, this is, this is definitely gonna be more appropriate for exercise physiology, but again, learning these terms now can really help. Resting cardiac output. What this means is that at rest, cardiac output, the amount of blood your heart pumps out per minute, you can get about five to six liters per minute. Okay, so again, cardiac output is blood pumped per minute. Okay, how many when your heart pumps and beats, that's your that is actually what we would call the next thing, which is your stroke volume. Every time your heart beats, what happens is you release blood into the arteries, into the art into the aorta, and what happens there is that amount of blood pumped out is actually what we call stroke volume. All right, so stroke volume is per beat, cardiac output is that amount of blood it's stroke volume per minute, all right? That's kind of what we're talking about there. So you can see that, again, per B versus over the course of one minute. Well, you can see here that a normal everyday person, it doesn't matter if you're trained or high, you know highly trained or sedentary, you're, you're, you pump out about the same amount per minute. But the difference here is, um, you know, the stroke volume because a person who is highly trained doesn't have to have their heart beat you know, as much as a person who is sedentary. That's what we're saying here is that if your heart rate is lower, your stroke volume is naturally higher because your heart doesn't have to beat every, you know, once every second. It can actually be less than that or, excuse me, it'll be more than that, meaning you can, you know, at 45 beats per minute, you're saying what, about every second and a quarter that we're looking at, you know? You're, so that means that your heart doesn't have to pump out as much. It, it, it pumps out more blood in that, B than it would if you were someone who is out of shape that has maybe 74, 75 beats per minute, right? And then maximum levels, look how much, it, you know, here's at rest. Look what happens to maximum cardiac output when you get into exercise. It actually almost, uh, it, it, it's almost seven times higher. And then your max stroke volume versus your resting stroke volume, again, significantly higher. And then obviously, like we were talking about before, if you're working at max load, if your heart, maximum heart rate is 200, well, then you can see here that it's going to be 200 for everybody. Just means that you're going to pump out more cardiac output, or more blood, because you're working maximally, but your stroke volume is naturally higher than someone who doesn't work out more. So what are we saying? Stroke volume is really the main reason why, you know, we get more blood to the system versus, um, 
versus card, you know, versus changes in heart rate. Okay, it's the stroke volume that really makes the difference for that. All right. Now we have an assessment class in the program, but just understand that what's the purpose of why we assess for physical fitness? Well, the main reason here is simply because we want to see where people are in terms of a starting point, a baseline number. And then from there, what we can then do is keep going and keep seeing where their fitness levels are and how they improve so that when we improve, we can then change their, their fitness goals or we can change their current fitness status to you know, help them to do more things or change what those current things are that they're doing. All right. So then we come into what we call the principle of individuality, which we're saying here is that no matter what, everybody responds differently. And that's what we're talking about here. I could give the same exercise program to five different people if we had a group exercise class. I can give everybody the same prescription, but of those five people, all five will have different responses because you're going to have people who are responders, who show improvements naturally, all right? Or they'll show higher levels and you'll have people who are non-responders and you'll have people in between that have different varying levels. A non-responder means they'll have small to no improvements. But again, that depends on fitness level. It depends on what it is that you're doing in terms of exercises. So some people might respond better to upper body exercises. Some people might respond better to lower body exercise. So it just depends on the person. So again, we want, we want our people to show these improvements. So if they are, then they are responders. If they're non-responders, it means that, okay, we got to look at something a little bit differently. We have to keep monitoring it and we have to then make the changes accordingly like we need to. So again, you know, with assessing um, cardio endurance, what we're going to do is we're going to find truly what their max VO2 is or what their VO2 is normally at working levels, okay? And that's really the most important thing there. Now, we can test for that under certain conditions, and that's really, again, like I said, that's for another class, but by assessing, we're truly seeing what the maximum volume of oxygen that you're taking in is, and that's, again, VO2 max. So with your VO2, what we're saying here is that you know, what are the components? Well, it's heart rate, it's stroke volume, which we talked about, and then it's the amount of blood that we actually, the amount of oxygen we remove from the blood at the muscular level, all right? So what we're saying there is that if you have something which is called AV, this is actually for exercise physiology, when we get to, it's AVO2 difference, and that's really what this is called, Okay? arterial venous oxygen difference. And what we're saying here is that when you take and pull oxygen into the working muscles, you're going to have less oxygen, obviously, because it's being pulled in to be used. And then you're going to have increased levels of CO2 because you're, that's the waste byproduct of O2 being broken down. So you'll have higher levels of CO2, higher levels of O2. So therefore, there's a difference in the a, V, arterial, and then venous blood levels of oxygen within the system. Now, that's part of it because as you sway blood back to the heart after, you know, it's been, you know, oxygen's been taken from it, we have to then be able to re, you know, reattach oxygen to hemoglobin and get it back to where it's got to go. So, what we're constantly doing is taking and we're taking and removing and then resynthesizing up in the lungs to get more O2 into the system. So the higher levels of O2 that are taken out, the more oxygen is readily available for the system, and that's part of that's another you know, major component of VO2 or oxygen uptake. Okay, there are certain tests we can do, and like I said, you know that's where the assessment class will break this wide open, where we'll actually can. We do um, the step test, we do the mile walk, and when we do either the mile and a half or the two mile run option, but the, you know, the mile and a half run is truly what, it, you know, run a mile and a half, walk a mile. The step test is a three minute, so this actually should stay that. It should be a three minute step test. The A strand rhyming test is a bike test, and then a 12 minute swim test. And all of these are able to show where we are in terms of our VO2 max, where we are in terms of being able to take in oxygen correctly, okay? But just a couple things here. We want to make sure we do a health history questionnaire to make sure people can participate in our assessments that we would ever do. But we would also make sure that, you know, anybody who is at risk 
of any, you know, cardio, cardiovascular, kidney, or metabolic diseases needs to get a, an exam before they get tested just to make sure that they're not at risk for having anything happen to them. So when we look at, you know, uh, max VO2 levels, if we were to figure out what their VO2 max is and compare it, this is where men would show, you know, depending upon their age, you can see, you know, poor all the way up to excellent, and then females, you know, same thing. Okay, so again, you may have a test question on that just relating to, okay, if someone has a VO2 max of this level, you'd know what, what category it really would put them in. So from there, what you would do is, you, you know, once you interpret those results, you determine, okay, well, if this person has a, this 42-year-old woman has a VO2 max estimated of uh, 28.2, we know that that person is in the average category. Well, we want to bolster them up to good or excellent if we could. So we would find different items that we would do in terms of exercises to help that lady improve, you know, exactly what it is that she wants to do and make sure that her cardio respiratory fitness or cardio respiratory endurance or health is going to be. That's why we would take those results and run with it. Okay. And then, so, you know, now that you've gotten these results, like, okay, well, that's great and all, but let's, you know, figure out what we need to do for an exercise program, okay? Well, there's a couple of things that you really want to understand before then, and that's mastery, attitude, health, and commitment. Really, as simple as it sounds, mastery. You know, what is it, you know, what do they know about starting an exercise plan? What do they know about cardiorespiratory endurance? What do they know about running and biking and things like that? Right. Also, there's also that self-control piece. You know, are they are they feeling like they can do a lot of this on their own? Um, so it just depends. Okay. Um, their attitude. Are they going in with a you know a, a pessimistic or an optimistic attitude? You know, what what is it that they're you know are they coming in negatively and that can really spoil everything? Where's their level of health? Well, we can determine that obviously through our testing. And then their level of commitment. Are they really committed? You know, if a doctor tells them that they need to do certain things in certain ways, that's really on, you know, the doctor is kind of leading them in that way. Well, that may not be the most committed that they would be, okay? So we have to think about that, um, you know, and, and or is it on their own where they're really trying to make an effort, Okay. So with those, you know, once we start, well, what are the advantages? They're all right there. You know what I mean? You're going to feel better. Your weight management's going to be better. You have more energy, you know, especially people who start losing weight. They don't, their body isn't working as hard to run their day-to-day -day life. So it makes it a lot easier. It's like changing the spark plugs in your, in your car after you've had it for a long time. It's like that car like livens up. So does your body. And then you, you know, obviously stand that less of a chance of the disease risk. Okay. So you're sitting there and you're like, okay, well, how do I figure this out? Well, here what we talk about are these aspects to put things together. Frequency, intensity, type, or the, the mode type, meaning what, what you're going to do in terms of exercise selection, how long you're going to go for in time, volume, and progression, and we'll go through each of those. So frequency, you know, obviously we're looking to do three to five days per week if possible, but again, some people might have to start off with one to two days because they're just not ready for it, all right? Now, last week we talked about how the average person, according to ACSM recommendation, needs about 150 minutes per week, all right? Well, that's great and all, but you know, we also talked about how 300 to 450 minutes might help with you know, weight management or avoiding weight regain. So we have to take those things into consideration as well. So frequency, you know, obviously three to five days is great. Um, you know, two to three days of, of, of cardio base could be great. Plus an additional one to two days of, um, you know, weight training would really make a big difference for these individuals or ourselves even. All right. Now, if we look, we can see here that what we're talking about is a typical heart rate and how it goes through our training sessions, all right? Now, as we, you know, prolong our, our levels, we can see here that we kind of, basically, we have a max heart rate that we can sustain, which we cannot sustain for a long period of time. This is our max heart rate, which means this person is about 27 years old. Oh, maybe not. Okay, so this here is just, this is going off a person who may have been tested. So, which is saying that their max heart rate is 193. 
which means that they have been tested because te- typically what we could also do is go off of what we would say their estimated max heart rate, which is 220 minus their age. But their heart rate is max 193. And we know that as we go through time, what happens with aerobic exercises, we actually level off. And you can see here, this is why our body, you know, it, when you first start, just say you go for a run. Well, as you start running, it's like, man, the first few minutes of this training is really awful. And then after a while, it kind of, it doesn't become easier. It just feels a little bit more steady. Well, that's truly what it is. It's a steady rate. And then at the end, you know, at the end of your training, you drop off here because this is your resting, but you can see that you come back down to resting, you know, fairly quickly after an exercise. But again, you're still going through those motions of everything and your body is still uh, very, very active in terms of it's very active in terms of metabolism you know your body is still still hyped from that training so even though your heart rate might come down metabolically you're still going through all of that stuff so um so you know going through again if you look here these are just saying that okay with the additional added amounts of physical activity how much it can actually change um your level of cardio okay So yellow, you know, so the more activity we put, obviously the bigger change we have in our risk for cardiovascular disease. That's all I'm saying here. So we said frequency, intensity. Well, how do we know what our intensity is? Typically, we want to have people work, you know, anywhere between 30 to 90 percent of their heart rate reserve. Okay, now that may sound a little bit crazy to you because you're like, okay, well, why is that? you know, a thing, you know, why, why is it that we're, you know, wouldn't I just go off of 220, you know, minus my age? Well, heart rate reserve basically takes into account your RHR or your, what we would say is your, you know, we talked about, I think, you know, resting heart rate. And that's what we're really, you know, want to know about now is your resting heart rate. All right. So just to kind of show you where we were at, but I'll pull that out. All right. So how we would determine what your heart rate reserve is, is truly will take, um, if we're right here, you know, we'll take our max heart rate, which is our MHR, which is 207 minus what we'd say is 0.7 times that person's age. All right. And what that would do is that would give us a somewhat of an idea of what our heart rate max should be. So if this person's 20 years old, we know that 20 times 0.7 is 14. Okay, which equals um, 207 minus 14, and that would be 193. Okay, so technically it would be 193. All right, so their heart rate is 193. So at that point, what we would do is take that max heart rate and plug it into this equation down here. To find our heart rate reserve, we would go max heart rate, which is 193. So we go 193 minus their resting heart rate. We'll just say their, mes- their resting heart rate is 60, all right? Which e- so that means that their heart rate reserve equals 133, okay? And that's where, we're- so now we have this number, okay? And now we have our heart rate reserve number. So what it says here is calculating your training intensities or your TIs at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, you know, anywhere in those ranges, what we would do is we would take our heart rate reserve times 0.6 and then add back in our um, resting heart rate if our training intensity was 60%. It's because 0.6 is that. So if we said, okay, well, I want to work out at, you know, 60%, my Heart rate reserve is 133, which we already found. So it's 133. There we go. Okay, so we're done here. So 133 times, we said 0. 0.6. All right. And then add back in your resting heart rate, which we said was 60 right here. All right. And add 60 back in. All right. So at that point here, what you end up having is um, a little bit of a you know a little bit of a different order. So it actually equals one thirty. It's one thirty three times 0. 0.6, which gives you seventy nine point eight. And you're going to add back in that sixty. Whoops, not sixty nine. Sixty, which equals 
uh, 139.8. And so that means a pr or, or about 140. So here what we're saying is that if we're trying to figure out where this person should be at, we want their working heart rate to be somewhere around 140. And how we would do that is we just took you through those steps there. Okay, we find the max heart rate. All right, which was here. Then we take the max heart rate and subtract the resting heart rate from it. Okay, which is resting heart rate, which we said was 60. Okay, so there's our numbers again if we wanted to line them up, which gives us a heart rate reserve of 133. Okay, we pull everything down from that heart rate reserve because it says heart rate reserve times our training intensity. All right, plus our resting heart rate, and we put that together, and we get that number of 140. So that means someone with a max heart rate of 193 trying to work at 60% would work at about 140. Okay, that's what, so we can obviously train, change our training intensities if we needed to along, along that 30 to 90% spectrum. Okay, so that's how we can determine intensity. And then what are we looking at from that vantage point? We're looking at things like, like it says here, moderate versus vigorous. Well, the more upper, you know, you, you know, the higher up you get in that intensity, if you go back to this slide here, vigorous is typically 60 to 90, where moderate intensity is 40 to 60, and then light is 30 to 40. So if we go back to our intensity, moderate versus vigorous, well, yeah, you're going to need more, you're going to work at a higher level of your VO2 max if you're in that, you know, vigorous intensity, which means that you're probably not going to be able to go for as long of a prolonged period of time. Okay. Um, that's really important with all of that. So the, the more you monitor and the more you work, the what's going to happen is you're not going to have to work at a, as high of a level of your VO2 max or a heart rate level because your body just naturally adapts to it. So if you're training at, you know, you used to train at one. 150 beats per minute, which was your, your, you know, 80%. Well, you were only able to get maybe, you know, you're maybe you ran a mile and a half at, you know, 18 minutes. Okay. Well, as you get more trained, what we're saying is that you don't have to work at that one. Maybe if you worked at 140 beats per minute, you could, you know, even get a quicker time of 12 beats per or 12 minute. Wow. Thir maybe 12 or 13 minutes as a, for your mile and a half time. Well, that's great because what it's saying is your heart rate isn't going to be as increased. So that means your body is not working as hard. You're able to consume the same amount of oxygen and then therefore you're able to basically get the job done sooner. That's really the most important part of that. Okay. So we talked about frequency, intensity, now time. The general recommendation, well, we talked about those generals, 150 for moderate, 75 for vigorous, anywhere between 20 and 60 minutes, you know, three to five days a week, you know, 60 day, 60 minutes per day is optimal. And that's really what's really the, the most important part of that is we're looking for the optimal components. And, um, you know, depending upon your level of fitness at that time is really going to dictate, are you going to work moderate? Are you going to work vigorous? Are you going to do a combination of the both? Okay, so it just depends. But for, there's your general recommendation, 20 to 60 minutes per day. All right, so how would you break that down? Well, you know, if you're looking at, if you're doing, if we go back to here, just say you're doing 20 to 30 minutes, you know, for vigorous exercise. Well, we would want to do a five to 10 minute, you know, warm up, a five to 10 minute cool down. All right, We'd, and then from there, what we could do is the 30, 20 to 30 minutes but we don't include the warm-up or the cool-down, so we end up with a total time of maybe about, what, 40 to 45 minutes of, of warm-up, cool-down, and training session, okay? The type, well, we talked about the type previously. If we were to scroll back up to the difference between aerobic and anaerobic, well, our type of what we're going to do are all of these things here. Again, walking, jogging, swimming, uh, cycling, cross-country skiing, you know, if you can't do cross-country skiing, then you can do the ski erg, which is the indoor version of that. They're your aerobics classes, your group exercise classes, things like that, and then jump roping are part of that. Okay. Now, that was your type. So what we're looking at, again, is more rhythmic. So it's not going to be stop and go. It's going to be continuous. Okay. And then 
cool thing about all of this is that with the you know frequency, the intensity, the time, the type, what we can do is we can actually use those movements to be better at bringing blood back to the heart. See what happens here is your veins, although they you know they pump blood back to the heart, they require smooth muscle and they require our muscles in general, our, our gross musculature, to be able to use it as a pump. Okay, so what happens is every time the muscles contract, that's going to force blood up because, again, we're working against gravity here. So when our calves, for example, contract, it's going to squeeze these veins to push blood back up to the, the top of the body and on top of that, get back to the, the heart faster so that we can get more oxygen to our working muscles. All right, so again, we talked about how... Um, it, you know, we have what we call sedentary death syndrome, and that's basically because you're not moving, you're dying. All right. So what we have to think about is we really need to think about how we can add in exercise to our day because we don't want, like it says here, that physical stillness where we're dying because we're not moving. So it gets really, really scary at that point. So yeah, trying to find ways to incorporate exercise it doesn't have to be 30 straight minutes, but being creative. And if you work at a desk, how can you get five minutes of movement in? especially if you're someone who is sedentary and doesn't regularly exercise, okay? And then going into our volume, what we're saying here is that, um, you know, how much are we getting in? Volume just means how many days per week we're doing it and how much during that day are we doing it and we can figure out what that amount is. So if you were, I'll just give you an example down here. If you were a runner, all right, and if, just say that you, you, you run... Um, five miles a day, um, five miles for five days per week. What we're saying here is that the volume is five times five, five miles times five days a week, which our, our weekly volume is 25 miles weekly. Okay. Now that's just, if you know, again, if you're a runner and you're trying to track that, well, how do you know you're getting healthier? Maybe it's easier you know, if you're still running five miles five days per week, then we can look at, you know, improvement of time could be the thing there. Or on, you know, maybe you're getting, you feel like five miles a day is, you know, not cutting it and you bump this up to six. Well, we know that that puts us at 30 miles per week, which changes, you know, the amount total and you're, you're putting more overload on the system, which will only help make changes that we want. Okay, so that's really important there as well. And then progression, that was kind of what I just showed you there, going from five to six, that's a progression. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that's one of the things that we want to make sure of is that um, with progression, we want to make sure it's done correctly, it's gradual, it's not too much at one time. So what we're saying here is that if you have a person who starts off at two to three days a week, maybe we progress them to you know, three to four days per week as they get better. But one of the things that we can do with progression is as we start to progress more and we see that these people are making improvements that we're working with, then ultimately what we want to think about is the intensity. Intensity really is the most critical component of all of this because even though time may stay the same, you can increase the intensity and get more bang for your buck in that time. So that's really what we're looking for there. All right. But that's all part of that fit VP, frequency, intensity, time, type volume and progression. And again, progression, it's hard to measure, but you can see the progression as the person is improving in many different parameters, such as time to completion or lowered heart rate while they're working and everything like that. All right. There, we talked about all this here. So you can always go back and take a look at that if you need to. And then, um, you know, what we're talking about here is as you start getting more healthy, we're going to see more development. You're going to start seeing that your, you know, your, your body might be changing. You might actually be getting more muscle mass. And so therefore, if muscle becomes greater, that means that your body is stronger and can propel you a little bit more as long as it's not making massive changes in your weight. Okay. So that means that we can probably do more and therefore we can burn more calories. We can be more aware of our body composition and all of that. Okay. So uh, METs, we're going to talk about more in exercise physiology, so I'm not going to get into that now. All right, But again, a MET is a metabolic equivalent, just meaning that if you're, if you're at rest, you're working at one MET. Okay, that's what we're saying there. And then lastly, you know, last couple slides here, 
We want to make sure that to help us and to adhere, we, we try to watch out for things like muscle soreness and stiffness. We want to take care of those. So we have to be able to make sure we're also stretching. So this week, you know, or not this week, next week, we'll talk more about flexibility. Um, but really just trying to make sure that we're diminishing. So if we're, if we're more sore and we're more stiff, what we're saying here is that it, it's going to take a little bit longer to heal. Well, the more fit we get, that usually goes away after two to three weeks. But you might be sore for two to three days. So what we have to do is make sure we, you know, we diminish that time and try to avoid that soreness and stiffness for too long. But we also want to stretch and be more flexible, have more range of motion so that we can avoid injuries later on down the road. So by minimizing soreness, we can actually get back to moving more and, and, be, and feel better. Okay. And then obviously those are disruptions. But what we're also doing here was getting started and then adhering is we're trying to build this habit of getting better at, you know, making sure that we're regularly exercising, okay? And then lastly, you know, obviously we just look at the commitment purpose. We know that the first few weeks of any training program is always tough, especially when you're coming back. So we got to be very aware of that because we just don't want people to drop out because like, I don't feel good or I, I want to maintain this, but every time I stop and I come back, it hurts more. It's you know, so we, you know, we got to understand those first few weeks are tough and challenging. That's why we got to be very um, critical about them. And so when we talked about the behavior modification chapter, how those types of, you know, setting goals and then being part of that whole trans theoretical model of developing change, this is going to be part of that is that the first few weeks are the most challenging and getting through that can be the biggest obstacle you may ever have until you start developing this regular habit. Okay. So that's, you know, cardio in, in a nutshell. So I hope that you take a look at this, review anything. So if you get to the end, go back and rewind it and pick up anything. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out because I'd love to be able to help you any way I can. So um, have a great day and we'll talk soon.